Hi, my name is Robert Rubenstein, and I'm the founder and chairman of the TBLI Group. Uh, and I'm going to give you a presentation on what is impact investing, why is it relevant, why is there so much interest, and why is there so much money flows going into it. We'll cover a range of topics. Uh, I'll have a brief uh, have a presentation to go through, um, and hopefully at the end it'll be clearer to what is impact investing. Okay, I'm going to cover a range of topics on impact investing uh, internationally and particularly in Asia. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, who is TBLI, my wife likes to say, we make dreams come true, but we're not in the cosmetics. Our work has been educating asset owners and managers about liquid and illiquid investments in sustainability for the last 25 years. Let's address some of the impact myths, that impact is a charity, no deals, money losing, no scale, too risky, bad management, no track record. We hear these myths often, but no one seems to question the myths of in investment managers always hitting their benchmark, which is not true. Private equity funds are earning 30% and hedge funds are earning 30%. All of those are often, often fiction. So I think we should address all myths, not just the impact myths. And I heard for 25 years, ESG data is not good enough, ESG data is not good enough, ESG data is not good enough. Financial data is worse. If we look at the last 25 years, the China hustle, WorldCom, Parmalat, Madoff, the financial crisis, trillions and trillions of dollars have been lost because of poor financial data, sometimes fraud. And there's never been a single company that's gone bankrupt because of bad ESG data. So I think we have to get real and stop harping on this nonsense that ESG data is not good enough. Let's start asking why, when is financial data going to be good enough? If you haven't watched a China hustle, you should. It's the real, the big short in real time. So why bother with values investing? To get people to accept it, you have to first show them or try to get through to them how they look at the world, whether it's only risk or only opportunity. But that's also the driver on how you get them to embrace uh, values investing, focusing on risk and opportunity. That's the language they understand. If we look at how much money there is in the world, it's massive. It's almost three, three and a half times the global GDP, which is why <laughs> there's so much volatility because there's so much money sloshing around. And the anticipation is that 2052, almost $41 trillion will be given from the families to their children. That's a massive wealth transfer. Most of the millennials are interested in values and impact investing. So that's going to create a tremendous market opportunity. That's just the United States. Perception, if we look at this cartoon, which happened right after the uh, financial crisis, people were surprised that poor people with bad credit couldn't afford to buy a home and nobody knew. Our challenge is very much is addressing the ignorance, the lack of education about what is ESG and impact, why is it relevant to, to investors. This is some of the, the thinking that we had to deal with in the last 25 years. I will live each day as if I were the only one that mattered. I will do anything I want to anyone who can't stop me. I will regard each tragedy that befalls my fellow man as an opportunity for personal profit. I will exploit the weaker and less fortunate. I will remember that war is good for business. And nice guys finish last. I will invest with Wormwood Bay. I will invest with Wormwood with Bay. Wormwood Bay. Wormwood Bay. Wormwood Bay. Wormwood Bay, the stock fund for socially irresponsible investors with performance that outpaces the market year after year. At Wormwood Bain, we invest only in the smartest, meanest, most ruthless businesses in the country. Companies that underpay workers, bust unions, export jobs overseas, use third world child labor, and ignore environmental regulations because they add more short-term dollars to the bottom line. And in the long run, we're all dead. So if your greed is bigger than your conscience, Invest your money with Wormwood Bain. Market savvy. Socially irresponsible. We don't give a shit. And for those of you looking for a job, they're hiring. The challenge always been is how do you get buy-in? How do you convince asset owners about 
values or ESG or impact investing. The real challenge is access because most people who have a lot of money don't have signs, hi, I have billions, come visit me. It, they're very much isolated from new or different information, almost like a Xanadu from Citizen Kane, this moat around their home with virtual and real guards. I found that pain is a very effective way in getting the message through. The increase the pain on, on the financial business sector, the more that they start paying attention. But you have to show clearly what's the self-interest, what's in it for them, and most important, the money flows. Unfortunately, you still have to go to somebody, sometimes it's a woman, sometimes it's a man, uh, sometimes it's yourself, who doesn't really want to hear anything new, who's very happy with the situation, um, and doesn't want to be confused with the facts, fake or real. If you focus on the moral imperative, it won't work, because all of these individuals have a target and a benchmark to reach. And you could reach a moral imperative, but fail to achieve the benchmark, which means they're still fired. So don't focus on that. Focus on self-interest, opportunity, and money flows. Those are the motivation. Very important to confront the status quo. This I heard also, sustainable investing is risky. You know what this figure represents is $350 billion. That's the amount of money that's been spent on legal fees and fines because of the financial crisis, since the crisis, getting close to $400 billion. So to say that sustainable investing is risky, it's comical on a galactic scale, but we seem to be measuring with two different scales. And I often heard, we need, Robert, what we really need is solid mainstream investments. Oh, I say, like sovereign debt. That's worked out really well for a lot of sovereigns, like Cyprus and Greece and Ireland, or CDOs, which nearly created the entire financial meltdown, or stock market that didn't perform for 10 years. So these are solid mainstream investments, but they didn't seem to work out so well. And we try to address the traditional philanthropy model of take 100%, give away 5% of the interest uh, to help improve the social and environmental condition. We're saying take 100% of your portfolio, create a risk-adjusted portfolio. If you want to give away 5%, that's fine, but then you're using 105% of your money to create social and environmental improvement rather than five, and that's 21 times more which is a more effective use of your money if your goal is to improve the social and environmental condition. Here are some definitions of what is ESG, extra financial investing. We use the last one. So why are you making profit? Do you worsen, maintain, or improve the social and environmental balance? If you maintain or improve, then you're actually incredibly resource efficient, use very little energy, very little water, very little resources, very little waste, and very few fines have a great HRM policy because people love working there so you don't spend as much as your competitor on attracting the best and the brightest and keeping them, which means you make more money. That is the main business case. And this is the main macro driver. Why is there so much interest in values investing? So if you look at China's growth of six to 8%, if it's true, that translates that China uses reaches U.S. consumption levels in 2031. And that'll translate into a massive consumption of commodities. Then you add India and the other three billion in emerging markets and the rest and, and us in the West, and you could realize this linear growth line is not gonna happen because we don't have enough resources at this level of inefficient use. So the only way for the line to go up is massive resource efficiency, which is a great investment strategy going forward. And that's what a lot of investors are re rethinking. We cannot continue to use this level of resources at this inefficient use, so we have to make it more efficient. Factor 10, factor 100, using one-tenth to 100, which also translates into lower costs. Again, to recap, the drivers are emerging markets, Resources, resource inefficiency, wealth holders integrating philanthropy and investment, financial crisis for the financial sector, plus $300, $350 billion in legal fees and fines, staff and clients looking for purpose, regulation, stakeholder pressure, students and employee demand on employees and endowment, wealth management, and game with clients around impact. One of the best ways to engage, and I'll get into that in a second, 
self-interest and the business case. These are the main drivers. It's going far beyond compliance. Even Larry Fink from BlackRock said that the purpose of business should not just be profit. It should have a societal and environmental purpose. Sorry. If we look at the money flows, liquid assets, it's just been phenomenal, off the charts, going up and up and up, in, in very little coverage in the media. The U.S. market also grown very, very rapidly because people are seeing that these types of investments look at all of the risk. If you look at all of the risk, then you're, 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 it's a much more prudent way of managing your assets. Here's a breakdown of, uh, of assets by strategy and region. Asia has been lagging, but I think Asia now will grow faster than most of the rest of the world. There's a lot of cash, and they reach the limits of pollution. China is one of the few countries in the world that if you go into the hotel room, you find two gas masks in the closet because the air, uh, air pollution is quite bad. Green bonds also growing very, very rapidly probably will pass two to three hundred billion a year and more because more and more money is going into there and also the risk is not specifically higher. If we look at the green transition scoreboard, we looked for the last 10 years of the money going to corporate R&D, life systems, energy efficiency, green construction, renewable energy. It's been a massive shift of money going to that direction. Uh, again, wasn't on the front page of the New York Times, but it did happen. These are six focuses of verticals for a lot of investors in energy, food, water, healthcare, education, transportation, and often all focus on efficiency of, uh, of use, less waste, less energy, lower CO2, uh, just a much more focus on environmental and social added value. It's a short breakdown of some of the funds that have been created. Nearly every single fund manager has ESG or impact product. Very few are not doing anything. Uh, it's just that some have done more because they started earlier. Why there's so much activity? The climate agreement in Paris. Carbon has a cost now, and that is now translating into many, many, many um, changes in the performance of investment. You're seeing a paradigm shift sustainable investment. On top of that, you have negative interests in many cases, so you're not earning any money on keeping my cash in the bank. And also, on top of that, impact allows engagement with wealth holders. You can't really engage with your wealth holders saying, oh, I'm sorry, Harry, but your performance is down 1% because of interest rates. That's a dead conversation because you can't do anything about it. And that's 70, 80% of their portfolio. The part that you can really engage in is on the alternative investment side. And within that, it might be a razor thin product related to impact, but that's where they get, you get a smile on their face and that's where they become quite passionate. Even if it represents a small amount of money, it's a way of aligning their personal passion and interests with investment. Here are some solutions at scale. One of the biggest is public transport infrastructure. It's zero to low carbon. It's steady cash flow, no volatility, uh, no technology risk, uh, public-private partnership, AA rated, uh, and it's a way of decarbonizing portfolio at scale. Community banks in the U.S. represent $3 trillion um, in investment. They do most of the SME loans. They didn't get into trouble with the, uh, with the financial crisis. They didn't do that. They just provided savings and loans to small businesses. Secondary market of DFIs, Real estate, uh, particularly green real estate, fuel-free energy, and second generation, again, our strategies for allocating large sums toward ESG and impact. Here is an overview of some of the impact investing platforms that exist. There are hundreds. Fortunately, most of them are Craigslist. They're not investment grade, and they're caves without doors. There's no connectivity, so investors are not going to go on 100 platforms, and most of them fail. They don't really work. Uh, in actually getting money allocated. People look at it, but they're not actually transacting on them. If we look at the 20, 25 years that uh, we've been doing our work, 
there have been a lot of important milestones. The Carbon Tracker Report, the Thresholds 1 and 2, UNPRI, Creative Principles, Carbon Disclosure Monitor. But I'm going to focus mainly on the Carbon Tracker, which is a recent development. So Carbon Tracker said, let's say we have to stay at 2 degrees with a 20% probability. How much carbon can we still burn? What's our carbon allowance? So came to a conclusion, 886 gigatons of CO2. Okay, minus we already what we already burned, that leaves about 565 gigatons of carbon for the next 40 years until 2050. How much oil and gas and coal is still on the ground and carbon is still on the ground? Well, it's almost, almost 2,800. So you know, basically you have uh, 2,200 gigatons which have to stay in the ground, which means they don't really have any value, but they're probably still on somebody's balance sheet as a, as a reserve. So that woke people up and said, whoa, if they have to stay on the ground, that means they have no value. That means I'm paying for something that has no value. Uh, I'm not saying that the CO2 will stay in the ground, but if you believe that, then this is the consequences, and that means the valuation are skewed. This is uh, how it looks. We've seen the decimation of the coal companies. Many of them have gone bankrupt. Coal is still being used, but it's dropping dramatically as a fuel. $1.3 trillion wipeout of the energy sector a short while ago. Financial herd is coming together. It is forming. Uh, this is not an advice on how you should divide your portfolio, but if you want, you can create a risk-adjusted portfolio in the various asset classes using sustainability as a lens. I like to look at SRI or social responsible investing ESG as, no, as not a, a niche market, but a big party. We just got here early. You know, sometimes you go to a party and nobody's there and you say, oh, this is going to be boring. But you have the first mover advantage or the food and the, the alcohol, and then everybody shows up and you have a great time. So that's the same thing at the ESG. It's a big party, and we're here early. Real estate is a great investment opportunity because the minute that the building is built, according to sustainability specs, you see the difference in energy, water use, etc. It's immediate. It's not like the stocks and bonds. You're hoping the price will go up. The largest green retrofit was the Empire State Building done by a man named Anthony Milken, who was not a fan of sustainability. He was a numbers guy. And he did the largest green retrofit, $525 million. He paid for it himself. And then ultimately raised the, the rates, reduced energy use, water use, CO2, and then later sold the building for hefty profit. Um, this, this was a very clear example of the value of investing in sustainability, reducing the CO2, and then getting compensated for that. This is the world's largest UN SDG real estate project. It's in Asia, 40% reduction in CO2, and integrating nature in an urban setting that's climate resilient with no municipal waste. Energy, renewable energy, or fuel for energy, as we like to call it, has been growing consistently, consistently, all the time. The price of fuel free is compatible, is, is, com can compete now with uh, traditional fossil fuels without subsidy. And that will continue because the price of, of solar, wind, geothermal has gone down and that will happen also with wave energy. Here's a short overview of some ideas of investment opportunities. There are many, 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 many. There are too many to discuss in this short presentation. Next steps is the financial sector are hunters. They're incentivized for short-term behavior. What we need is more of a hunt farming approach because we've hunted most of the game. Uh, we need to re replenish, and that's what farming can do. So teaching farming to hunters takes time, but they're getting it. What you can do, uh, to paraphrase Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. Stay away from these polar bear or these photo ops of smiling children in Tanzania drinking milk uh, because they have nothing to do with the investment. They're, they're just cute, the photos, but that's not, you know, that's not what you're, you're, you're investing in. You're not bringing back the polar bear. We have to have less ribbon cutting and much, much more digging holes because that's what we need. And there's too much press releases about companies committing trillions when you look beneath the, the surface and there's not much happening there. 
Uh, Larry David gave great career advice um, um, about uh, what you can do to change business. If you want to change business, refuse to work for them when the recruiter comes to you. Hey, you want to get this job today? You're damn right I do. Can I give you? Can I give you a little tip? Huh? Let's do it. You're gonna go in. He'll be up here. Okay. You're down here, right? He's on top. He's asking you the questions. Uh huh. And then all of a sudden the interview starts. He asks some questions. You answer some questions. And then you start asking him the questions, and you flip it. Now he's trying to impress you. Turn that shit around on him. Turn it around on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you really want to change a company, don't try to change it from within. If you're in a position to be recruited by a, a company because of you're an MBA student or you have great talent, and it's important to you that they embrace values, find out what are the values of that company, and if they don't align with you, refuse to work for them and tell them. My time is up. For those of you who want to learn more about what we're doing, these are some of the events, and I hope to see you at a future uh, event. Thank you very much for your time and patience for allowing me to share some insight into uh, values investing uh, or impact investing. And I hope that it uh, changed some minds and that some of you will follow your heart uh, with respect to jobs and investment. Good luck.